and stumbled across woodcraft. At the same time, they explained here that there was this wonderful club that met once a month. And so I kind of had the best of all worlds as I got introduced to good turners and to the fact that the mini lathe that I bought was the least of my problems. <laughs> no tools, no lessons, nothing under my belt. So it's been a, a great experience and I uh, appreciate the opportunity to, to give back a little bit of it. And hopefully uh, one or more of you will actually uh, get a technique to turn spheres that makes it pleasurable and uh, reasonably fast. Uh, I tried turning uh, a few spheres. I had some wood and I wanted to make a little gift for somebody and I said, ah, I'll just make a ball right quick. And after making probably at least a dozen eggs, because uh, if, if they don't turn out to be spheres, they're an egg, trust me. They're always, that piece of wood wants to be an egg on that. Uh, but, you know, the fortunate part, and everybody who's been here for a while knows this, and the newcomers, you know, just, you, you don't know how lucky you are about, about the fact that this club has a lot of world-class turners, has, uh, you know, a symposium at your doorstep, which is just amazing. As another club within easy driving distance, is also an amazing wood turning club. So it's uh, quite fortunate in uh, having a store like Woodcraft available is also amazingly good. Uh, but early on, I started processing some of my own wood, and, and the wood bank is a real benefit to all of us. Uh, but I always wind up with lots of bits and pieces or a half a log like some of those you may have acquired back here. And if you don't process it soon enough, it turns into firewood or it turns into a blank for a sphere. You know, it doesn't take very big pieces. Uh, and we'll walk through kind of some of that, but I, I can't stand to throw away the bits and pieces of wood even though they ought to be firewood. So I've got boxes of these things and this is going to be something that will now that I've kind of got this down in a, a faster routine to do it, I'll probably turn a lot more spheres out of that wood. Uh, you know, and in one sense you'd say, why turn a sphere? What, you know, what earthly good is the ball? Balls are everywhere. And, uh, it actually is an easy project, so you don't have to have a lot of skill sets. It'll, it'll actually improve your skills quite a bit. Uh, it can be fast. Although, I, you know, I think it, the bigger the sphere, the longer it was taking me, and I realized, yeah, there, there's sort of an optimum size that makes them quick and easy, and it may vary for you, but I feel like something about the, the three inch range, which is, turns out to be a baseball size, uh, is pretty easy to turn, and it's easy for people to handle. Uh, it makes a great little gift. Almost nobody will uh, throw it in the trash in your presence. Uh, <laughs> And, and if they do, you're going to say, yeah, it was firewood anyway, and I was practicing. So, uh, And interestingly enough, although it's not a bowl or a hollow form, you will use almost every cut that you're going to use as other types of wood turning. Uh, it is, starts out mostly as a spindle turning, but you don't have to. You can arrange it if you've got a, a, a cube of wood and you want to start out like a bowl, you can. Uh, it's slightly easier as a spindle. Uh, I was thinking there must be a history to wooden balls, and there are a lot of games of balls. There's a lot of wooden balls out there, whether it's croquet, bocce balls, uh, a variety of games uh, that, that go into history. So my guess is, is that balls were probably turned as early as bowls. Uh, but amazingly enough, I, I don't have any verification of this, but Stuart Batty told me, so I know it's true, uh, that this is the way uh, ivory billiard balls were made to get them round. So it is possibly very, very round with these techniques. Uh, you may not choose to polish on them that long. I realize there, there is, like on many things, an infinite amount of uh, work you can do if you want them perfectly round. So you have to decide what's round enough on these things. Uh, I'm going to do a little bit of a slideshow and show you some, uh, there are a variety of techniques and uh, one gentleman mentioned to me that he just watched uh, a YouTube video. And yes, if you go searching on the internet, you're going to find lots of written material and I'm going to give you some references to what I think are 
are good examples so you can uh, uh, do some research on your own. But there's more than a hundred videos out there of people turning spears. And some of them are good and some of them are, you know, it's amazing what people will put on the internet. So, uh, tools, you, you have them in hand, likely. I'm going to use a bowl gouge tonight, I'm going to use a small spindle gouge, I'm going to actually use a big bowl gouge on a little ball, but that's okay, it works. Uh, you can, uh, you'll need a parting tool, uh, a skew and an angle brake scraper is useful. I'll also show you how to do the same thing with the large bowl gown. It's got a wing that works amazingly well as if it were a skew or a angle brake scraper. Uh, and then a, a small saw actually is useful to part off the little nubs and uh, some of the examples I've got up here show if, if you get one end of it down too small and you take that final cut and it snaps off and it snaps inside the sphere and you have a smaller sphere and a lot of work to, to make it a smaller sphere. Uh, finishing is just like any of the other wood turning. Uh, embellishments, I am not talented enough to do embellishments, so the best I could do is get some grooves on one of these. So I usually try to pick wood that is pretty on its own, but I'm going to show you some photos from the AAW that uh, some people did some spectacular spheres there. Uh, there will be some fixturing. It's very simple. It's made out of wood primarily, and you do it just as you're turning, so it's not a, not a big deal for that. And then I'm going to show you some references up here. As promised, uh, these are some photos that, this one actually came out of the uh, two-page article in front of the last uh, journal, came up from AEW, because they were advertising the uh, POP exhibit, and so there, there were probably at least 50 really nice works of art done by people, and the only constraint was you had to make it, make it as a, starting out as a sphere from a six-inch cube or less. And so those, these are there, and as you can see, you can embellish to your heart's content. This was done, uh, I believe, by John Wessel, uh, except Tom Warshin turned the bolts on those. So he did a, an amazing job, and he had another bolt right beside it that looked just as impressive. So a variety of materials, a variety of finishes, so you can kind of go where you want. If but if you're trying to make a sphere that's not a sphere, then people will notice. So we're going to hopefully help you make it a sphere and then move on to those. Uh, a gentleman by the name of Mike Hulsuck, a Canadian, was doing a thing on uh, our whole rotation on spindle work. And in the middle of it, he turned a sphere in probably six, seven minutes. In baseball size, and he says he gives them away to a charity and and marks them up so it looks like it has the stitching of a baseball on it. Uh, and one gentleman from the audience raised his hand and said, but what if I can't make it round? And his answer, and he was being a little flip because he's in the middle of his demo and moving on, was, well, you just have to learn how to make it round. And I said, oh, well, it, you know, there, there are several techniques and just Trying to make it round on your own without any uh, guidance is going to be a little frustrating. And I was fairly frustrated doing this, and I remembered that uh, I had had an all-day lesson from a gentleman by the name of Soren Berger at Lee Carter's studio, probably eight or nine years ago. And he has a method and a technique for making spheres that is almost guaranteed to make you successful. You just have to follow a few instructions. And uh, I'm going to show you some tools that he sells and things, but I'm also going to tell you, you don't need them. There, there's an easy way to approximate what he does. Uh, but there are also other people, so again, someone I, I actually respect quite a bit is Sam Angelo, and he's got a series of six videos that talk about making spears, and he interviews Richard Raffin with the technique that uh, he was using in a couple of the videos. And what that is, is that you, is that you actually realize that a sphere is simply a ball trapped in an octagon. 
First, you can start with, well, you know, it's a ball trapped in a cube, but it's actually a ball trapped in an octagon, uh, even more so. And so his technique, and this is, and by the way, I've got handouts for the key parts of these slides if you want them at the end, uh, is that you turn the octagon, you part it off, and this one twist it off so it's a much smaller sphere. Uh, you turn the octagon, make a jam chuck, you jam the octagon into it. And that actually turned out to be easier than I thought, but it's harder than it ought to be. Uh, and you turn half the, uh, the octagon off in the jam chuck. Then what I found is you have to actually remake the jam chuck, you have to cut off the outside to put the round part in, and then you turn that off. So that's a fairly simple technique, and I'm going to show you how to, an easy way to get it into an octagon, but uh, Sam also did it where you just, you know, kind of the same thing. You take cuts until it looks like that. And it's a 45 degree angle, and you can make little cardboard templates. Uh, that, you know, just, just mark it and cut it out, and you set it against it and say, is it? And yeah, it is. So it's pretty easy to go from there. But I think it's not the easiest way because you still have to, and you can pass that around if you want, you still have to make it round. And it takes, you know, not hard chucking, but it's a little different kind of chucking. Uh, the second way that I saw demonstrated, and several people in here have seen it, and apparently uh, started with Alan Batty at least, and Stuart Batty is really good at it. And Stuart, one day after a class, we had, I don't know, five or ten minutes left, and somebody says, I've heard you can make a sphere in five minutes. He said, oh yeah, sure. And threw it up there, and five minutes later, he had the sphere better than any of those. Um, now, it turns out, if he teaches you how to do it, and I do have a reference to an article written by Barbara Crockett, and that was actually, I believe, in the youth series of AAW papers. Uh, and what gets added is that you turn it as round as you can get it, which is, you, you will eventually get that pretty well going, but you use a parting tool and you cut a very slight uh, groove in it, then you make a jam chuck, you take it out, align the groove along the ways of the bed, and cut another groove in it. And you take it out and you rotate it around and you cut another group in it. Each of those groups is actually a circle because your legs is turning around. So then what you do is you jam chuck it and start taking off that outside surface until you match the little groove that's made by the party tool. Uh, you can do it with just a pencil mark on the surface, but then you have to look for high and low spots, which is this gives you the sphere. Now you have to match the diameters of each of those, but it does work. And I think my jam shut no longer jams, but it it's really nice when you've got a wet piece of wood to make a jam chuck out of. Just don't depend on it being a jam chuck later. And then the, the technique I'm gonna actually turn wood on it's called uh, or I named it the Burger or Hockenberry because the, the research I did showed that yes, Sorn, Sorn Burger, who's a very good turner out of New Zealand and a fellow named Alan Hockenberry, who's also a good turner out of the US, developed a mathematical technique. And so the, the bad news is it requires math. The good news is there are some shortcuts that eliminate the computation. But they go along the same lines, which is, OK, there's a sphere captured in this octagon, which started out to be a cube. There actually is a better sphere trapped in a 16 again. I'm not sure what 16 side makes. And then there's an even better sphere. Uh, if you take off all the little high points and make it a 32 gun on this. Uh, and it seems like that's a lot of calculation because it turns out the, the flat part here, the flat part here, the flat part here, are each supposed to be 0.414 of the diameter. And it's just 
simple triangular kinds of computation to go through. And then beyond that, you can also compute all the rest of these little measurements. And because most of us, first we don't know what diameter we're actually working with. Uh, and then, even if you know, you got to say, okay, it's 0.414, and then uh, you start going down from there. And Soren Berger actually sells a set of tools. And I'm fortunate to be the proud owner of one, which after I started uh, doing this, I realized, oh, I bought those things eight years ago and I barely used them and tried out. And I'll pass these around. Uh, I think I can show you a way that you don't need this tool, but it's just impressive that it works. And this tool measures diameter. This is 0.414. Actually, it's not 0.414. It is minus. So this is 0.3, whatever it would be. So this is a measurement from the outside in, whereas the flat on it is supposed to be the 0.414. So this is it's an analog computational tool. And it works great, very nice piece of stainless steel. Uh, I did look on uh, Soren's website, it is alive as of yesterday, it wasn't earlier in the week. And you can still order one of these for 70 bucks plus $15 of shipping on there. So again, I think I can show you a way that you don't need it. Now, the tool I really do use of his is a diameter radius tool. <coughs> so it just gives you half the measurement here, here. And that turns out to be very useful for the, the technique. How many people in here don't know how to make a cylinder out of a turning block? Okay, I thought so. So, what I normally do, you can make uh, a sphere perfectly well between centers. Uh, and, you know, as, as you go down, actually I did a somewhere practice making, you know, multiple spheres between centers. Uh, it, if, if you have to do extensive amounts of work on it, it actually is a little easier if you put it in a chuck. So I pre-turned a piece here. Uh, wood. A dry piece of wood is going to stay rounder than a wet piece of wood. A wet piece of wood is almost guaranteed not to be round in the end. Uh, and it may or may not matter. I was showing that large sphere there was a piece of crab apple that a neighbor cut down uh, two months ago. And it's checked, but it's not badly cracked. And the only technique I used on that that I'm trying a little more as so I actually uh, microwave that. Yeah. Uh, and I microwave the, the blank to start with. And you're not trying to cook this and make it smoke in your microwave. Uh, you might not like the smell after you do that a few times. But if, if you don't overheat it, you just produce steam. Uh, you eat it just long enough so it's steaming, and then you take it out, let it cool, you heat it again. Uh, it seems to work pretty well. I've got some of these speeches. This is a piece of ash that was just limbs. And what I find, I'm making limbs a lot of times because they're actually kind of interesting. This piece of walnut was a limb. And so it's got nice patterns on it. Uh, if you get a wood that's got some good contrasting, uh, you, know, you know, it's almost all of us say, oh gosh, you know, I have that you know, wonderful tree and all I've got is a few limbs left. Uh, they can make things as well on there. So the, the basic technique for what, what I was term, terming the, uh, the uh, burger Hockenberry technique, the mathematical approach, uh, is once you turn a cylinder and actually Soren Berger made us practice turning cylinders, and he declared that most of us can't turn a consistent cylinder. You know, we're going to make it not even diameters all the way along. Some techniques that he emphasized, and one of them is if you're using a, uh, a uh, spindle gouge, roughing gouge, is that if you'll put your tool rest up, hold your finger against it, and then lay it in here and move 
Boa tarde. Pretty good. Yeah. So you're good to but, go. you, but you lay your finger in there, just hold your thumb on it. And his explanation of all this was this is actually a skew, but a catch proof skew. It's just rolled up. So you can put it in there straight and you just move it across. And if your finger's inside the tool rest, uh, you can be pretty consistent and get a nice even cylinder out of it. Now, my experience has been is it's not actually required that the cylinder be even, but it makes it a little easier on your life. So, take a measurement, and you don't have to use these specialized calipers, you can use you know, regular calipers. But what you're looking for is, I want to know the diameter, and as soon as I get the diameter, uh, Oh, one other piece is if you are going to hold it with a, uh, a live center in the back, cut down enough so that you're actually uh, not going to have the point of that live center in. I like these step centers because they're spring loaded and so they don't go in as far when you crank down on it. But what you want is enough of a little ledge here such that your indention doesn't show through in your sphere because then you're going to have a sphere with a, a hole in it on that. But measure diameter, mark it off. And then in the uh, the uh, burger technique is you measure in 0.3 inches from each side. So this so in the middle you have left the 0.414 of the diameter. Uh, and that tool was designed to do that. Uh, there's another approach to this, which is why this is being half is nice because you can just mark midway and you can do that by measuring it or not. Or you can even guess it. So that's 50%. But being a fairly clever guy, I realized, oh, okay, then 50%, if I do half that again, it's 25%. That's getting awful close to 0.3 which is the amount that you measure in from the edge. So if you go in 25% plus a little bit, 25% uh, from here, plus a little bit. And so the, the first marking you get is like that. And that's a dead one. So now what I've got, and you do all this marking, and then what you wind up needing to do is do a relief because the, so this defines your sear, one outside, so right now we've got it in the cube. So we want to create some, I cut these earlier and it's wet, and so it's not round. That most of this wood is going to disappear. So just for the, this has to be a diamond part of the wood, you can use any kind. But what you are going to need is clearance. Now the other part of your marking that's going to be required is that you need the same distance. the same distance down on this side as you marked off here. So you can either use these types, which are just little marking calipers or any other type of caliper. These allow you to get in pretty well. And the line I'm trying for is a circle right there. Now if you can envision it, a straight line between this mark and this mark turns us into an octagon. And even though you say, oh, well, really it just needs to be at 45 degrees. And yes, if you can cut 45 degrees, that's good. Helps me to have these two marks on here. 
Uh, the same thing over here, it's a little harder on this side only because you've got some waste material. So I think the clear a little bigger piece. If you're buying wood, so it's very valuable wood to you, uh, there are some ways to get in here without uh, using up too much of this, and I'll show you how to make a little. I'm going to make both the friction chuck as well as a small base out of this. Now this one turns out the area here, if I measure this top area, this 0 0.41 below. Get that. I get that. So I, you know, once I made these marks, I just say, okay, I knew that. And then the circle that I just input here should be that same size because you're looking, all these surfaces are going to have the same uh, linear dimension to them. So once I say yes, it is that circle, then all I have to do is measure that tenon. Now, if you're making a very small uh, sphere, you want to be careful you don't get this too small. And so you may have to stop and not go down, but you should be able to go down to that diameter in most woods. Spare here, I could have also done the same thing where I turn just a little bit of a tenon uh, that this goes into. I turned it a little smaller than that earlier. So once you get this to size, so it's the same size as that. Then you can. If you, well, I can't reach like that. You can mark that edge again, just so you have a visual little spot. And you probably can't see it with the video camera, but I'm just marking this edge that's at this diameter inside. Now, the technique for doing this, I said these were. All standard cuts, but uh, again, one of the things Soren had us practice quite a bit was making a straight cut. So the first straight cut you work on is the cylinder, and you go across this. Uh, how do you do a straight cut between those two lines? And if it's not exactly straight, it's okay, but it just makes things go faster with the straight cut. So what I'm going to do is just use a 5 inch bowl gallery or half inch bowl gallery and start with the blue close going in and the other nice measuring tool if you want uh, if you grind at a 40 degree, 45 degree angle that's a good guideline. So if I start at this line if this, if I have the bevel touching all the way down, it ought to be pretty close to 45 degrees. Uh, it's a pretty hard cut if you start at that line and try to go in. So rather than doing what you would normally do for a cove where you start with the flute up and you roll it over, uh, if you start with the flute closed and your tool pointed straight into the work and a low handle, slightly and just raise the handle. And the line is very straight.
Octagon that contains us here. We'll do the same. And the more clearance you give yourself on this side, the less you're going to do it like that. So now we've got part of this done. So now we're going to 
a smaller flat on the top. We've got a flat. And if you're doing this well, then each of these flats turns out to be the same size. And you can actually measure that if you want. And we have to do this. And this is where a little bit of eyeballing, particularly on this side, comes in. Uh, that bolt gouge is too big, so I'll go down to my 3 8 spindle gouge to finish that part off. I'll just do this one on this side. And this is where, as you get used to doing it, you're either going to you know, want to make more marks or you're going to be happy that, okay, I kind of get the pattern now. We take off the high spots. There's a sphere contained right there right there. I just keep taking these long spots off. Uh, and again, if, if you wish, you can mark this again. But most of the time now, as I said, I uh, actually Soren Berger has a video out and it's in that link of things where he shows how to use his tool to do this. But even without the tool, that's a good one to watch because he does show you his marking technique. And even though you're not doing exactly the mathematically correct lines, uh, for our work, they're close enough. You can get a sphere out of all this. So then at this point, when you get it down to the fact that, okay, I've got 16 flat surfaces. And you can either decide that I'm pretty good at following a curve. And this is just like running a bolt. Start and the only good news again if you start with a spindle orientation is you do go from a large diameter to a small diameter. So you're cutting with an, you know, an agreeable grain orientation. If you start out, and particularly if you have a, a cube and you have to decide to chuck it up as a, a bowl between two spindles, you can still do this. You just have to be aware that you're doing bowl turning in that. Uh, it helps have a sharp gouge, as well as you know, just remembering that you, you are going to be running into different kinds of grain when it's in the bowl into orientation. So at this point, you either take a series of cuts, and what you don't want to do is cut into the sphere. So as you go across those flat areas, what you're looking for is the tip of your gouge is the high spots. So it's a little odd in the turning. And I've got one little line still there. So if you mark the lines in the flat area, what you'll see is you can actually ride over and not cut away the lines. So I'll do it on this side where the camera can see it. Also helps if you can uh, uh, do what would you call it? And by the exterior cuts, you don't have to. It just makes it a little easier. Now, since I'm not very good, I still have a little bit of a high spot there. I spot there, there, and there. But hopefully you can see this giving. These are pretty good. Around there. Now, the next part of this, you could either use a negative rate scraper, you can use a skew, or you could use the wing of a swept back wing bowl patch. Because right now, it's almost like sanding. You're just going to, to take those high spots off, and your eye is going to start telling you that it's pretty round. And it is. But my experience with my eye is it thinks it's pretty round, but it's not so round. So there are some techniques, and uh, one that some people mention is just get a PVC pipe fitting, something like that, and start looking at it. And what you're doing is you're looking for light that comes in under, uh, because this is a nice circle. And it turns out the light's the good spots, because that's the low spot. So you want to take off the dark spots. 
And right now, I can see, I can't really see where the camera. Zoom in a little bit. Put in here. No, I don't remember. Right, so I'll use a little piece of PVC pipe. There you go. Yeah. So I can rock it. There's a high spot right here. It rocks back and forth because it's dark here and it's light. And the sides are I can rock it. So this you know, just says okay. Then I need to need to do a little more scraping, a little more cutting. But typically, if you follow the the line technique fairly well, they're not removing a lot of material. They're fundamentally is like sanding. You could sand it, but I usually find it hard to sand high spots out. I almost always. So I use the wing, wing of the whole ground. Also, take a skew. Aren't you going to And you just, I would typically raise it so it's flat with it. And this starts taking off two marks, high spots. I'm always working that center line. You don't want to remove the center line. The center line is there for me. It, it orients you. So 
So I typically will move that light behind. Yeah, it, it, it should be round here when you put it in because the lathe made it round. Uh, I'm the one responsible up here, and I can barely see the light. I'm putting the inner ring on that line, the screen down there. So that's in pretty good shape. A little bit high right there. And you can use your favorite technique to. And you can make this a push cut. Uh, as I said, I saw Stuart Batty make one of these in five minutes with nothing but a bowling gouge. It's just fairly frightening watching talented people work on that. Uh, so that is essentially done. I do another check. Just to say how, how close am I? See that, but it's uh, right on line with the uh, the flat spot of the tent. So now we get to the all right. What is the best way to you know, take this ball off to do the final finishing? And there are a couple techniques. One is to you get that tent as small as you want as you can. So I'll go back to the party gap if I finish that. Now you want to make sure that you don't cut a flat on your sphere here. So you'd rather be a little proud because you can, you can work on that when you do the, uh, the friction chucking that I'm going to show you shortly. What I'm trying to do is cut this tendon smaller and smaller, but at the same time leave a little bit of uh, material for me to round at the very end. So if you need get in on that one. So where I'm talking about working is right in there where the tenon oops there we go beautiful the, the tenon meets the ball is that if I come in too straight I'll wind up with a flat kind of on the surface of the sphere and that means to get it round I'm going to have to take that much off of the, all of the sphere and at this point this gets harder and harder. It's okay to sand in one of these friction chucks. Cutting a lot of material in a friction chuck is problematic. It, it can be done, but you'd rather not. So what I'm going to do is just come in here with the parting tool. Make sure I have a little bit of time. Because this is setting a little bit proud, then I can come in. And if I can't do a push cut, just about the point where I cannot. Sometimes I will take a small parting tool. You see that? Yeah. It's just a parting tool. And interestingly enough, the edges of this parting tool, not just the point, to the edges up here, uh, actually are affected. So as you come in, just like I was using the negative brake scraper, I can actually smooth with this parting tool. But what I really intended to do is to start taking off just small amounts of that and start cutting that tenon with this very small parting tool at an angle. So I'm still leaving a little material prowl on the surface of the sphere. And this is about the point, and I'm down to less than three-eighths of an inch. I'm going to go all the way around and I'm just using this tool. I could be using a skew, I could be using a negative rate scraper, I could be using the wing of the couch. That's really all I'm trying to do is get those tool marks out and those high spots out.
So I'm not wanting to take off a lot of material on that. We check. It's a little higher right there. And if, you know, sometimes I have a hard time remembering where my high spots are. Well, look, I don't know if I can see that on camera. Uh, it doesn't shine. The light not is much. Too it's too so bright. A little bit of high here. Just do a little pencil mark. And I can actually see it right about here. Uh, this is sort of the same kind of thing that your eye gets used to watching where you're cutting and when you watch this upper surface. I can see I've got a flat right here and a little bit of a hump there. So Whole, whole, whole lot easier 
you actually make something that works. Instead of this live center, and I could have used this live center, uh, but this is one off my mini leaf. So it just got a little semicircle made in it. Probably will hold this. Uh, and this is one where I just drilled a hole with a Forstner bit that was close to the size of my mini life, life center. Put a little tape on it until it jams in. It works. But anyway, that's one way to do it. Uh, a very nice way is you can buy these nuts at the uh, hardware store. They're three quarter by 10 DPI. Uh, I don't know if you can see the inside of that one. I'll just take it off. If, if you have one of the live centers that's got threads on it, uh, the club one has the cone on it. Uh, I find I don't use the cone that much, a few times, but I just took a piece of wood, turned a hole that was slightly smaller than this nut, used my uh, spindle as a press, and put it in, and then turned the shape on it. You can also use these for uh, the mouths of bigger vases if you're wanting to hold them back. So you can make these things up ahead of time. If you don't want to go spend a dollar and twenty cents for a nut, or uh, it's not a perfect solution, you can also get a, a tap for these size for. $10, I think. $8. $8, okay. Uh, this is a piece of crab apple, but I tapped it, put a little CA glue in it. And it goes on as well. So any of those work for a, a friction shove. And normally, I also have a little pile of these made with a uh, uh, the, the appropriate size for your chuck, and so you can just put them in and turn a little bit more. But we're very fortunate because tonight we actually have a piece that we want to not only use as a friction chuck, but we're going to make a base out of this. So this is just like making a little bolt. Uh, and what I found, I started making them trying to contain more of the, the sphere in there. But what I found is something that you know, has 15-20% uh, is enough. You don't have to make two half cups because you don't have much that will go in there. Or you don't have much sanding surface. Just open some down. Nice to work wood, so you can. It depends on how much smaller than your uh, stock that you're making the sphere. Uh, but you can proceed on down and make this a jam chuck if you want. So, this is one I made out of the same piece of material, a little piece of cottonwood. See that? So, this was, you know, stock. It was that big. And you know, I got a crack in it and several things. It's nice. So, you can make a jam chuck if you prefer a jam chuck. So, this wouldn't make a very good piece to jam chuck in because it's too close to the same size. But most of us have blocks of wood in the wood shop that are just asking to be a jam chuck. But if I'm, uh, we had so many limbs that came down, and I kept dragging in a few specimens that the wet wood makes really nice jam chunks. Uh, what you're looking for here is a little bit deeper than an exact radius for the, for the sphere. And you look at it, you measure it, you see. Pretty close. Uh, the other thing I found the harder the wood, the less this is a problem, but if you come cranking these things in here, you will mark the wood. It's, it's, or if you don't crank it in hard enough so that it spins on you, then you're going to burnish the wood and 
uh, I spent many hours trying to sand out burnished pieces of wood. Uh, and again, depending on what you're looking to do, this is a pretty big one here. Uh, you could reduce this some size. Oh, and the thing I was going to mention about making jam chucks like that little guy, the, the more you relieve the back of that chuck, this side right here, the, the better jamming it will do. Now, af after a certain point, you're going to crack it when you shove it in and things, but if you make that nice and flexible, you can also wet this wood. If it's dry wood and you want it to be a better jam chuck, get your spray bottle out and spray it a little bit. Works pretty well. Uh, I typically relieve that corner right there because that is most likely to mark your sphere. So let me just break the tail stock. Break it a little bit. Doesn't hurt to lock it out. Uh, I tend to sand both directions, and every once in a while, this thing will vibrate loose, and this will start spinning in here. But one of the ways you can tell if you did a good job is uh, you should orient the line, remember the line we were keeping all along, orient it parallel with the waist, put it in here, and then your little nubs on both ends are at the maximum where, the, where they will show up the most. And what you start looking for is the shadow line when it's spinning. It starts making that noise, it means it's, it's tightened, it's unhappy. You see a little bit of shadow line, and this one's not round, but it's not bad uh, in the spinning on the I'm not sure we get anything about that with it. But what you're looking for is it grossly out somewhere. Uh, and usually you're going to be most out on each end because that, when you're working down here, your tendency, uh, and I think uh, a couple of instructors I've had have talked about, you know, if you really want to judge the way your bowl looks or your vase looks, you have to take it out. I think you said that, Vince. One time you have to look at it the way you're going to look at it because it doesn't look the same as when it's on the lathe. I almost always make mine a little too long, so they're a little egg-shaped when I start, so I consciously watch that. But I've also made a couple with flat spots on them, and you don't want to do that, because it's a lot easier to take a little bit of a tip off here than it is to take the whole material off, or the rest of the surface down to where that goes. Uh, the way this is, is I would probably just take in a negative rate scraper or a skew. You could do it with your bowl gouge. I'm just going to come in here on center. And just take a little bit of that tip on. You can hear it's not round. It's only hitting the high spots. But after you do a, your first pass on this, you look at it. And you see where am I taking wood off? So it tells you a little bit more about where it's round. So right now I'm just working on the tear out. Now, here we've changed the orientation. I'm not doing spin the grain anymore. I'm doing in grain as it comes around just like a bowl, and so that is okay for very light cuts, but it's, it's not uh, appropriate for cutting into the in grain. So I'm going to rearrange this just a little bit. Very smallest amount. And before you get you know, taking off large amounts of material, 
Try to mark it this way. It's got one mark on it. Mark it this way. Because now I want to do the turn that puts a new surface up that hasn't been marked. So again, you've got 390 degrees that you're going to be working with here. So you again look at this new mark and make it parallel with the ways of the bed. On occasion, you get down to almost no wood, and it still makes a little base. So it's kind of up to you. If you got this much wood left, you can get a little more creative. Uh, but there's nothing particularly spectacular about this. You just decide how tall you want to make it. them over so you get the opportunity to try making this just like you would a bead. Or if you're like me and you don't make very good beads and you can make them triangular, you can add two beads. You can decide 
how much contact you want with the sphere. It really doesn't take much to keep it from rolling off the desk. But if it gets you know, knocked a little bit, my cat thinks these are the best toys in the world. Uh, if you would like to decorate, this could, uh, those of you who like chatter tools, you're going to make these tops, you could put colors on them. Sometimes just a couple of lines. Yeah. So one problem with this ash, it does like to chip a little bit. Sanding on it, but uh, it's fairly nice. Send it up here. Get the small parting tool. You can use a large one. I typically like to make these just like you would the base of a bowl, put a little concavity in there. That way it stays flat, particularly since I'm using wet wood. This will work. Best example of what I with wet wood is this one. You see that? Mm -hmm. it, uh, it's now very artistic. It still works. Uh, I mentioned microwaving the wood earlier. Uh, I started out just microwaving the ball, thinking that would keep it from going oblong and I realized no nope, that just made it shrink faster in the directions it was going to shrink. So now what I do is I will take a blank if it's wet and it can be a limb and just microwave it probably uh, you know no more than two to three minutes, two minutes in mine will boil a cup of water so you know, that's kind of the right stage. See how hot it is. Don't leave it. You know, that's a good place to drink your cup of coffee or something while it's working. Uh, the dry woods you would think would be nicer, but I've actually had several cracks mysteriously appear in long season wood that didn't look cracked at all, but you relieve the uh, tension in it sometimes and it will move as well as sometimes it'll crack. Uh, depending on what you're trying to accomplish, that crack may not hurt you. Typically they're checks, not big cracks. I don't think it's in there and it's too scary. Your uh, $2.99 saw works and then whatever your favorite sanding technique is, you get the power sander out and work at it. It's not sitting flat where it is, but a uh, little bit of time on my power sander, and this would be done as well. Are there any questions? Uh, as I said, it's more times I repeat it, the more I think I understand it, but it doesn't hurt to review what's actually happening when you take off those high spots. So I've got handouts if you want them. Uh, I've also referenced you to the, you know, as I said, Sorenberger's video on YouTube is very good. He's gonna show you how that tool is supposed to be used, but he uses all the same techniques. And even he, after uh, getting to the 16th mark, goes in and starts doing just halves on the flat surfaces for it. Uh, lots of other videos once you start searching for balls. But hopefully this will get you started at least. Uh, you should be able to do a better one than that one for your first one, but what I'm grading myself on is not the fact that I've got chatter marks and little dings and pieces here, is that it's fundamentally round. And with a little bit of more work, this will be a sphere. Thank you. Oh, okay. limited to a 
white bond penetrating uh, finish? Because I don't know how you finish those. Uh, if, if you, you no, know, I've used polyurethane white bonds on them, and, and that presents problems about how you hold it, which right. is why if you make a little base, that's kind of nice. Uh, but you've got to kind of do halves of it on it. Uh, I don't know how you'd spray it. Right. Uh, my, my guess is you could use some of those little cones and support it, uh, you know, figure out some kind of technique, but you no, know, I've only used uh, walnut oil and a uh, little poly if I want it to be uh, shinier. I typically, with the walnut oil, I'll buff them and wax them, and that kind of, again, mostly what I'm looking for is a, is a hand feel. Mm -hmm. If you're looking, like some of the images up there where they're more art and you want the nice shiny bossy. I don't know how you would hold them other than very carefully. Yeah. Three, three small finish nails is what I use. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Lock of wood. Yeah. yeah. So just keep turning it. Give it a little shots of lacquer. Or... All right. Well, uh, thank you very much.